Hello, Wonder Hussy here, out in the middle of nowhere, standing in the middle of old historic Route 66. That's right, the Mother Road, the most iconic of all desolate desert highways. And when I say desolate, I'm not kidding. I mean, here I am walking down the middle of it and there's nary a car in sight or much of anything else for that matter other than the train which for some reason is pulled over on that random sighting in the absolute middle of nowhere so i guess i can't say there's nothing out here there's also an abundance of beautiful spring wildflowers that's right it's i'm shooting this on february 22nd i think that's the date today and these bushes are just going bonkers with beautiful yellow flowers. It's springtime. In fact, it's such a beautiful, warm, sunny day that I might need to take my sweater off. <laughs> Getting kind of hot. Oh, absolutely love it when it's warm enough to change into a t-shirt. Anyway, you might wonder, why am I hanging around this particular stretch of old, lonely, forgotten, abandoned Route 66? I mean, if there's nothing out here, well, gee, wonder, hussy, Why'd you drive all the way out here? Well, believe it or not, this isn't actually nowhere. This is somewhere. Specifically, a place called Baghdad. And you can tell we're in Baghdad by the presence of this lonely tamarisk tree. In fact, it's the only tree for many, 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 many miles around. And at the base of the tree, there's this really cute little sign. I mean, it's just a state of California sign, but look how the way it's worded. This tree is the last fragile remnant of the town of Baghdad. Please help us to protect it by leaving it undisturbed. Thank you. I don't know, I just think that's kind of cute. Uh, and apparently it's working because there's an astonishing lack of litter around this tree. I mean, okay, it isn't a very heavily traveled highway, but you know, still, the one tree in 500 miles, you think there'd be all kind of crap piled up under it, but there isn't. In fact, I think there might be some stickers on the back. Yep, some folks left some Route 66 stickers. But other than that, it's relatively clean. Although I did notice nestled in the crotch of this lonely remnant of Baghdad, isn't this a geocache? I mean, that's what it looks like to me. Otherwise, why would there be this waterproof container stashed in a tree in the middle of nowhere. Let's open it up. I love finding these things. Maybe I have something in my car I can contribute. Okay, and there's a little plastic bag inside it. Oh, and there's a little cloth baggie. Ooh, double surprise. I'll go with the cloth baggie first. Oh, it's a, oh, it's a Oklahoma stamp. This is a stamp. See how it's in reverse, the state of Oklahoma with Route 66 on it? I guess use it to stamp out. <laughs> <laughs> Oklahoma Route 66. That's kind of cool. Uh, or uh, what passes for cool in this part of the country. Anyway, let's see what's in this baggie. Uh, what could be in this? Ooh, double bagged. Ooh, this better be something good. They went through all this trouble. Could it be a million dollars? Could it be the phone number of Jack Dorsey? Oh no, look, it's a little tiny notebook. Route 66, Oklahoma. This was planted here on June 21st of 2023 by Snake Doctor. Congratulations, you found a letter box. This is not trash, do not discard. This box is part of a worldwide treasure hunt. Inside you should find a rubber stamp and a logbook. Please return it to where you found it. This is not a geocache. Take nothing out of the box, put nothing into... What? What the hey? Boy, I've seen some stuff in my day, but I've never heard of a letter box. I don't get what you're supposed to do with it. There's a stamp. And then there's this booklet that most of the pages are blank. You know, there's nothing in it except for the first few pages. Okay, so there's a stamp of Oklahoma on the front. Then there's a stamp of a, it looks like kind of like a dragonfly. It says Lake Havasu City, Arizona. Piper's GMA from LHC, which I guess is also Lake Havasu City, Arizona. Go Billy Go, Ada, Oklahoma, Lake Havasu City, Arizona. Joy Song Bakersfield. Teepee, Arizona, Santan Valley. 
And then that's it. What could this be? Oh dear, a mystery already. And I barely just got started on this day. Well, gosh, if anybody watching this happens to know what a letterbox is and what the heck you're supposed to do with it, please let us know in the comments. Meanwhile, I'm just gonna put it back in the box and put it back where I found it. I mean, it says, do not take anything out. Do not add anything to the box. So who am I? not to follow orders. Uh, anyway, that box had nothing to do with why I'm here in the former town of Baghdad. Okay, I guess Baghdad, California was named after Baghdad, Iraq because it's hotter than blazes out here. In fact, I read on Wikipedia, this is I think one of the driest places in the United States. I think they set some kind of world record for the most consecutive days without rainfall. Back in 1912, they went something like 780 days without a single drop of rain. That's why they named this place Baghdad. And as you can probably deduce by the proximity of the railroad tracks, Baghdad was founded as a railroad town. And that's pretty much all I know about it. There wasn't a whole lot of information online and there aren't any buildings left. In fact, I guess it hung on as a railroad town and then I think it did okay during the heyday of Route 66, maybe. But I think back in, I think I read like back in 1970, for whatever reason, they came in and bulldozed all the buildings. So there's really nothing left here, except, well, that tree. And then supposedly, on the other side of the railroad tracks, there's supposed to be a cemetery. Now, if you're like me, you love poking through old cemeteries. And I was a little bummed when that uh, train was parked here for a minute. So when I rolled up, the tracks were clear. Then that train pulled in and stopped, and I thought, oh gosh, I'm never going to get over to the cemetery. I drove all the way out here to go to the Baghdad Cemetery, only to be blocked by the dang train. But fortunately, while I was poking through that letter box, the train moved again. And so now there's just this, I don't know what it is parked on the tracks, but it's not moving. There's no engine attached to either side of it. So I feel very confident in just climbing over it to get to the other side. I guess these are the things that you put boxcars onto, like you would fit boxcars in between each of those supports. I mean, is this what you would have to run and jump onto if you were trying to hop a freight train? You always wanted to do that, ride a freight train like the hobos used to do and like plenty of hobos still do. I don't know if I quite have the cojones for that, but uh, well, it's kind of interesting to see one up close in person like this. It makes you realize though, how rough you have to be to hop a freight train because this is rough, man. You have to grab onto that and hoist yourself up and throw your pack and all your gear and no, thank you. At least no thank you for now. That's not to say I won't in the future decide to try and hop a train. Now we're crossing the tracks to the other side of the uh, railroad where supposedly the Baghdad Cemetery is. Yeah, see, look. I mean, I guess this is still, I don't even know what you call that, a sighting? The Baghdad sighting? Okay, well now we're at the other side and now I gotta try to find this cemetery. Only thing is, I don't see anything that looks anything like a cemetery. Good thing I have it saved on Google Maps. There's no cell signal out here, but I did download the map before I got here. So it looks like if I just walk this way for a few minutes, I should be at the cemetery. And it looks like we might be walking through the old Baghdad trash heap, I mean. Real old can. Oh my goodness, look at this. Wow. It's like a whole cup and saucer set. Oh my goodness, how about that? It's almost like tea time. Wow, that is really cool. And there's a bunch of this china out here. Look, it's part of an old bowl. I wonder if it says anything on the bottom. George. Somebody named George. Good old Baghdad George. Okay, I think I found the cemetery. <laughs> Using my powers of deduction, I spotted a cross up ahead. Sherlock Holmes ain't got nothing on me. But golly, talk about a lonely, desolate grave. I mean, there's no name, no information, just a very rough, well, two very rough pieces of wood sort of strung together with barbed wire, marking the fact that somebody once lived and died here in Baghdad. I mean, I hope that guy enjoyed being alone in life because he's certainly all alone in the afterlife. Maybe he was a loner because he's buried way over there and it looks like the rest of the cemetery 
is way over here. And that was probably old loner George, the lone wolf of Baghdad, never wanted to be around other folk. So when he died, <laughs> they planted him a discreet distance from the rest of the townspeople <laughs> who were buried over here in the Baghdad Cemetery proper. Wow, I mean, talk about a cemetery. Again, very rough hewn, wooden stakes. There's a metal stake, barbed wire, just sort of marking out the final resting places of all these Baghdadians. Baghdadis, I'm not sure what you call people from Baghdad, but uh-oh! Here comes another train! Uh, it just occurred to me that this is a two-way street. Uh, just because I was blocked from getting to the cemetery doesn't mean I might not be blocked from getting back to my car now. Fortunately, it doesn't look like this train is gonna stop. It's just blazing merrily along its way. Oh, it looks like the BNSF, what is that, Burlington? Northern Santa Fe, I think. Who knows? Uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and check out this cemetery and get back across the tracks while I can. You know, as much as I do enjoy poking around these lonely desert cemeteries, I really don't wanna have to spend the night here. You know what I mean? Hey, look at this. Somebody hung this little owl reading a book of Christmas carols. Oh, it's a caroling owl. Somebody must've come out here and hung this at Christmas time. Aw, I love that. Almost as much as I love the fact that the train went by and now I can get back to my car. Uh, anyway, none of these graves have any information on them as to who lived and died here in Baghdad. And some of them don't even have crosses on them. You know, it's just a lonely pile of rocks. But there is one single solitary grave and it's not even really a cross unless somebody came and cut the top of it off. L.A. McKay. 1914. Somebody named L.A. McKay was, I guess, died in 1914 and was buried here in this cemetery. And that's all we know about it. In fact, that's pretty much all we know about Baghdad in general. So not a ton to see here in Baghdad. So you might be wondering, is this really why you stopped here? Just to look at a bunch of wooden crosses and a sign by a tree. Well, no, actually, there's one more amazingly interesting and actually really sad thing here in Baghdad, and that's another grave, or another marker for a dead person, but it's not anywhere near the cemetery. It's all the way back on the other side of the highway. In fact, that means I gotta cross back over the railroad tracks before the next train comes. <laughs> made it. Man, I really didn't want to get stuck on that side of the tracks. And you might think I'm just being a silly goose for even worrying about it, but I actually kind of have PTSD because one time I was in Marfa, Texas. If you ever been to Marfa, way out in West Texas, staying with a friend of mine, he booked an Airbnb on one side of the railroad tracks, but all the bars and restaurants were on the other side of the railroad tracks. So my friend and I checked into the Airbnb and made ourselves comfortable and smoked a little reefer. And next thing you know, let's go out and get a bite to eat, have a few drinks, meet some locals. So we went out, walked down the street, turned right to go across the railroad tracks and a big old freight train came grinding to a halt right in front of us, blocking the tracks. And this was one of those really long freight trains, maybe like a hundred cars. Super far, couldn't see the front, couldn't see the back. And it was bisecting the town of Marfa. And believe it or not, there was no pedestrian overpass or underpass or any way to get from one side of the tracks to the other side of the tracks while the train was there. To this day, it still blows my mind. And yes, we had smoked a little reefer, but we weren't that high. I mean, we looked around to see if there was any other way to get across the road, but there wasn't. And so we waited like, okay, well surely this train will pick up and start moving again. We waited like almost an hour and the dang train never did move. So we ended up just going back to the Airbnb and I think my friend had some beef jerky and trail mix we had for dinner. Anyway, that's why I was afraid of getting stuck on the other side of the track. So again, back in my car, 
I'm going to go ahead and change into my flip-flops because it is way too hot to be wearing these boots today. Especially when you're jogging over railroad tracks. Much better. Okay, anyway, now let's go across the highway to look at this other really interesting but really sad thing in Baghdad. And who knew there were so many interesting things in the so-called middle of nowhere? Okay, this is the other interesting thing in Baghdad. Oh wait, dang, this isn't even the thing I wanted to look for, but it's also interesting. Golly, I didn't even know about this. It says hallowed ground. I guess there was an emergency airfield here in 1930 and 1931. But then it says during World War II, the federal government converted many of them to military use. So this was the location of the Baghdad Auxiliary airfield it says it consisted of two unpaved runways and an l pattern each runway was 3960 feet in length the airfield had a beacon for nighttime identification and underground fuel storage but on april 9th 1942 just four short months after the attack on pearl harbor a u.s air force at7 navigator was on a navigational training exercise with five crew members it says around 8 40 p.m residents in baghdad could hear an aircraft approaching and they were able to see its lights but at the last minute residents said they could hear the radial engines on the aircraft accelerate the aircraft impacted in the desert short of the runway the landing gear was torn from the aircraft as it cartwheeled across the desert for 250 yards wreckage was scattered over a quarter mile says no official cause of the crash was ever determined but pilot disorientation was suspected well i guess that would have been richard ford i don't want to talk bad about the dead you know it was dark there ain't no lights out here you know honest mistake so first lieutenant richard ford lost his life second lieutenant william hovey second lieutenant byron f vandenberg aviation cadet robert baker and aviation cadet leonard baliff and then they got uh I don't know if that's supposed to be a AT-7 aircraft, guys. You'll be able to say for sure if or not. But anyway, this, yeah, this monument marks the site of this horrifying plane crash. Golly, and here I thought Baghdad was just a quiet little stop along the rail. Oh, crazy stuff going on out here. Matter of fact, it looks like there's two more graves over here, and I can't imagine. Maybe these are symbolic graves for the airmen? No, because there's one, two of them, and there was five guys who died in the crash. I can't imagine. Who would be buried over here? This is nowhere near the Baghdad Cemetery. I mean, even the town loner was at least buried on that side of the railroad tracks. And then look at this one, another lonely grave. Somebody left, oh, somebody left a book. The Complete Encyclopedia of the American Automobile. Oh my goodness. It says, I'm oh, sorry about my shadow. Del Bowman from Palos Verdes Estates. Oh, I wonder if this is, I mean, could Del Bowman be buried out here? Golly. Boy, this is a fun book. I could spend hours looking through this. As I'm sure Del Bowman probably did in his life. Uh, if this is your grave, Del, golly, I'm sorry. But believe it or not, none of this is actually why I came over here. There's something even more interesting than everything you've already seen in this video, but it's farther out that way. And I guess I'd better go get my car and drive to it. Okay, wow, this is harder to get to than I thought. Apparently, you can't even drive to this thing without a hike. About a third of a mile, according to Google Maps. Okay, you guys, guess what? I made it to the place that I wanted to show you, but unfortunately, well, there was a note asking people not to post pictures of it on social media. Okay, I guess the guy who placed this thing, which it was a memorial to someone who died out here, he doesn't want the federal government coming out here and tearing it out because, well, you know how they are. They don't want you to erect any permanent structures on federal land. Well, anyway, it's a terrible story. I can still tell you the story. And you'll just have to use your imagination uh, to imagine what kind of memorial this guy put up. So, the story was it was back in August of 1988 and there was a bunch of Marines doing a training exercise out here. Okay, there's a big Marine Corps base just over the mountains there in 29 Palms. You may have heard of it. Big Marine Corps base. They had the guys out here at night doing some kind of 
navigational exercise. And they were doing it at night, I guess, because it was August, August 30th. Uh, and you know how hot it gets. I mean, look, I had to change into a t-shirt and flip-flops and it's February, what did I say, 22nd? <laughs> Imagine how hot it is here in August. Well, actually, you don't have to imagine. Uh, it says online that the temperature the following day, the 31st, was 107 degrees. So even at night, you know, it would have been, gosh, the nighttime lows at that time of year, probably like in the 80s, maybe even 90s. But it's still cooler than it would have been during the day. So that's why these Marines were out here doing this navigational exercise. I guess they were guiding trucks or something. Anyway, they were supposed to have been placed in pairs along the way but the guy who was in charge this first lieutenant alan dawson was his name i think well he screwed up and he placed this one poor guy lance corporal jason rother by himself and so he placed lance corporal rother you know stand here and you know wave a flashlight or whatever they had to do and then you know at the end of the exercise we'll pick you up and i'll go back to the base well unfortunately First Lieutenant, I'm sorry to laugh, it's not funny at all. First Lieutenant Dawson forgot to pick up Lance Corporal Rother. Now you tell me, how do you forget one of your men? I don't know. I mean, it's dark out here, I guess. It's easy to get disoriented and forget how many Marines you had on the bus. But I just find it absolutely astounding that they made it all the way back to the base in 29 Palms and they all had something to eat. They all took showers, they all went to bed. You know did what they had to do and they still didn't realize one of their men was missing that's right believe it or not it took 40 hours for anyone to even realize that they had left a man behind in the desert 40 hours and ironically the only way they even finally realized he was missing is they counted the guns and they realized they were short one rifle now doesn't that just tell you something about the military they value their weapons more than they do their personnel. Which, if you've ever been in the service yourself, you might think is rightly so, or you might think is a crying shame. Anyway, it took 40 hours for them to realize one of their men was missing. Well, in that time span, remember, it was 107 degrees that day. Okay, I guess they were doing the exercise on the night of August 30th. Maybe it was the night of the 29th to the 30th, I don't know. He was out here for 40 hours, man. And so what would you do if you were in his shoes? I mean, probably, you know, he's, they placed him at his spot and okay, Sarge, I'll stand here. Or aye, okay, aye, first lieutenant, whatever, I'll stand here and do my thing. And then he figured, you know, in a couple hours they'd come pick him up and they'd all go back. Well, he probably, it's so still out here when there's not a train going by, he probably heard the trucks rumbling, the Jeeps or whatever they brought him out here in leaving and he might have even seen the taillights in the distance taking off without him can you imagine what a lonely feeling that would be to know that i mean he probably didn't realize or would never have even suspected they forgot him i mean how does the marine corps you know one of the fiercest proudest divisions of the military how do they forget a soldier but you know maybe he just figured there was some oversight but whatever as soon as they realized there was an empty seat on the bus they'd come back and they would get him. And so I'm sure he wasn't too worried about it for the first hour, two hours, three hours. He was probably starting to get a little bit nervous. I know I would. And I don't know if he had any water with him at all. I mean, I'm assuming when they posted him there, because it still could have been like 80 degrees even at night, they probably gave him at least one bottle of water or a canteen, whatever they had back in 1988. You know, bottled water wasn't always ubiquitous like it is now but he I mean surely he had at least a little canteen or something although I read online that he did not have a compass nor a map another egregious oversight by the military I mean who who drops a soldier off in the middle of the desert without a compass and a map and water I mean you should even have like a lighter matches or something with like basic survival equipment although I am wearing flip-flops in the desert so who am i to talk anyway this poor guy was stranded out here and as the hours ticked by i'm sure he kind of started to get worried especially when he would have seen the first rays of the sun coming up over the horizon can you imagine how scary that would have been you know knowing that once the sun comes up it's gonna get hotter and hotter and remember there are no trees out here 
anywhere except that one lonely tree at the old Baghdad town site. So it's not like he even had any place he could wait in the shade. You know how they tell you if you're ever lost in the wilderness, you're supposed to stay put because they did know where, I mean, I assume his first lieutenant knew exactly where he had placed him. And so when he did finally realize he'd forgotten him, he would have come back and got him, but it was hot. You know, if he stayed put at that site, then he probably would have died of dehydration. I mean, yeah, there's a little teeny tiny bit of shade cast by some of these bigger creosote bushes. I mean, I suppose he could have, maybe if he just laid prone under, with his face under a creosote bush and just didn't move, maybe he could have lasted 40 hours. I mean, oh my God, this poor guy. I'm sure he didn't expect that it would take 40 hours for people to find him. Well, anyway, long story short, when they did realize they had forgotten a man, they did. They mounted a huge search. They had a thousand guys out here looking. They had helicopters. They had heat seeking infrared equipment trying to find a body in this vast expanse of desert. I mean, it's worse than trying to find a needle in a haystack. They searched and searched and they never found him. Well, I shouldn't say never. They didn't find him until it was too late. Believe it or not, they didn't find his remains until December over three months later. And his remains were found by the sheriff's department, not the military. I mean, all of this, I know like different branches of the service like to bag on each other and go, oh, the army's the dummies, or oh, the navy's the dummies. And I have heard the Marines called the morons, but again, it was an innocent mistake and I'm sure the first Lieutenant felt terrible about it. In fact, I think he ended up being sentenced to something like four or five months in the brig. So he had plenty of time to think about it and feel bad about what he'd done. As did the entire military. I think, I mean, this poor guy died and it was a terrible thing, but at least, you know, something good came of it. I think they changed their protocols when it comes to <laughs> counting heads when you come back from a field exercise. I mean, I don't understand. I thought it was really hard to get away with sneaking out of the barracks. Like you want to sneak out and go to town and drink and party with chicks. I thought they came around and counted heads and uh, apparently not. Anyway, this poor 19 year old kid who only weighed 135 pounds, by the way, I guess he, after a certain amount of time, realized he better start walking somewhere. And since he didn't have a map or a compass, I don't think, I mean, the Marine Corps base is about, I think 20 ish miles that way. And I've read different, differing things online. Uh, or online it says he managed to walk 17 miles and he made it to within two miles of the Marine Corps base and that's where they found his remains. Can you imagine walking 17 miles in this desert over those mountains in that heat? But then at the memorial site it says no he actually was dropped off somewhere back there and he was walking towards the highway. I guess even without a map or a compass somehow he was able to navigate towards old route 66 which back in 1988 might not have been quite as desolate, but it was probably still pretty desolate. If he could have made it to Route 66, the odds are a car would have eventually passed, hopefully in time for him to, you know, get help. Or the train, you know, if the train was coming by. I don't know how that works. If a train engineer is allowed to stop for a three quarters dead Marine, he was probably all tattered and sweaty and sunburned, like, help! I mean, I don't know, are there any railroad engineers watching this video? If so, would you be allowed to stop for something like that? Or is nothing to get in the way of almighty commerce? These goods must be moved and we don't care how many Marines have to die because of it. I don't know, man. I feel like if I was driving that train and I saw that poor Marine come out of the desert, I'd pull them brakes. Well, anyway, it's a moot point because poor Lance Corporal Rother never did make it to the highway, but he was so close. His memorial site, which is placed where they found his bones at the exact site, is less than a mile from the highway. So gosh, it's really easy to shoulda, coulda, woulda, like, oh, if he coulda just gone, you know, that last three quarters of a mile, he might've made it, but who knows? All we can say for sure is that a Marine died alone in the desert, somewhere out here, just outside Baghdad. In fact, there was a kind of a cool inscription written on the memorial, and it was a really nice memorial, by the way. I'm not even going to describe it, though, because I don't know. The guy asked people not to take pictures and share it on social media. Anyway, it said, 
Lance Corporal Jason Rother, forgotten by a few, remembered by many. And I feel like that sums it up. I will never forget this story. As much time as I spend hiking through the desert on hot days, <laughs> well, from now on, I'm gonna make sure I always have water with me, a map, a compass, and appropriate footwear. So even though I would have loved to show you guys what that memorial looked like, and I don't understand why the feds don't mess with that other monument we checked out, the one for the plane that went down. Well, I don't wanna jeopardize this lonely little memorial. So I'll just end this with a salute. Lance Corporal Rother, wherever you are now, I salute you. <laughs>